This is one of those weeks when current events changed the course of my sermon. I was going to preach about the themes of Advent, waiting and patience, and I will. But what's been really weighing on me, and I know on many in this sanctuary as well, is the news that came earlier this week out of Ferguson, Missouri. The grand jury decision was announced Monday evening that Darren Wilson, a white police officer, would not be indicted on any charges in the August 9th fatal shooting of Michael Brown, an 18-year-old African-American. Now, I'm not going to preach the news this morning because you can get that from a plethora of media outlets. And I'm not going to concern myself with the details of the altercation between Wilson and Brown or the in intricacies of the legal process in Ferguson. Too many conversations this week have argued over these detracting from what I believe are the deeper and more significant issues. Instead, this morning, I would like us to consider the larger story that we've seen play out across the nation. Waiting, despair, rage, systemic unfairness, mistrust, and passionate working for justice. This is not just about one young man one police officer, one jury, one prosecutor, or one U.S. city. These are issues that every town and city faces, and issues that touch our lives in direct and indirect ways. Some of you have read the book The New Jim Crow by legal scholar Michelle Alexander. We have offered a couple different classes on it here at the church. Alexander makes the point that we have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. She writes about the racial dynamics of the war on drugs, profiling by law enforcement, and the U.S. criminal justice system, which claim to be colorblind and in practice are anything but. Today in the era of the new Jim Crow, law enforcement kills black Americans at nearly the same rate as Jim Crow era lynchings. Let me repeat that. Black Americans are being killed by police at the same rate that they were being lynched during the era of Jim Crow laws. Put numerically in a recent study drawing from public information such as police and media reports, one black man is killed every 28 hours in the United States by police or vigilantes. Black Americans are about four times as likely to die in custody or while being arrested than whites. This is why protesters in the wake of Michael Brown's death chant Black Lives Matter. Because when black Americans are being killed at such a rate, it sends a message about the value of their lives. Now, I don't mean to suggest that all of these killings are intentional, targeted or consciously motivated by racial prejudice. But I do want us to be aware that we all carry racial bias that comes from the way that we have been socialized and conditioned by the society that we live in. We didn't choose it, but we cannot ignore it. We carry in us suspicion, mistrust, and stereotypes. And this is what systemic racism is rooted in. Imperfect, biased human beings create institutions and systems that reflect our imperfections and biases. And these biases are then enforced because supposedly that's the way the system works. Racism is so culturally ingrained that it's not always obvious, particularly to those who are privileged by the system, that the system is functioning unfairly. Many of us work to counteract these biases in ourselves, but psychological research indicates that such biases shape our first response before logic ever kicks in. This dynamic is well documented in law enforcement as well. Participants in a study by the University of Colorado shot an armed target more quickly and more often when that target was black rather than white and participants decided not to shoot 
an unarmed target more quickly and more often when that target was white rather than black. Last Saturday, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old African-American, was playing by himself in a park near his house in Cleveland. He had a toy gun. Someone called 911. The police arrived, and two seconds later, they shot Tamir twice. After he had fallen to the ground, the officer radioed that there was a man down, probably 20 years old, with a handgun. Officers often find themselves in dangerous situations, fearing for their lives, and must make split-second decisions like this. But it seems that this officer and the person who called 911 had judged Tamir Rice to be much older and much more threatening than he really was. Racial bias was at work here, and it only took two seconds to end the life of a child. Tamir Rice was not administered first aid until several minutes after he was shot, and he died the next day. When Michael Brown was shot, his body lay in the middle of the street, uncovered for hours. Think about what it means when young black men are treated so inhumanely. The story of Michael Brown and of Tamir Rice and of Trayvon Martin and of countless others is all too familiar. The police officer or neighborhood vigilante assumes a greater threat and uses greater force than needed, and the result is another life lost. And yet police officers are rarely indicted in such cases. Some people, people for whom the legal system works, would say that charges against police officers are unwarranted. The system is doing its job and we should accept it. For many others, however, the system is broken. It fails them time and time again. They experience systemic injustice. And these two differing reactions are a sign of deep division and mistrust that plague our society. A few weeks ago, I attended an event sponsored by Mothers Against Police Brutality, which is a Dallas-based organization that brings together mothers and family members of those lost to police violence, along with supportive allies. The organization works to bring awareness to such cases and advocates for accountability and policy reform. At this event, there were calls for justice, statements about the interconnectedness of what happens in Dallas with what is happening in Ferguson. But what touched me the most were the stories. Stories of mothers who had lost their sons. Stories of mothers whom the system has failed. I saw their sadness and I saw their outrage. I was at this event not because I've been touched directly by police brutality, though I have witnessed it but because I wanted to stand with them and honor their experience. If you look at mothers like Colette Flanagan in Dallas, or Leslie McSpadden in Ferguson, or Sabrina Fulton in Miami, or at Ferguson protesters around the country, and cannot understand why they are angry and outraged, I encourage you to listen, to open your mind and heart to their outrage, to see it and to feel it. As a church, we have been exploring our understanding and practice of empathy and compassion. And I challenge us to bring that empathy practice to this situation and to see what we might learn through looking and listening and engaging. Rather than dismissing the experience of others, arguing with them or belittling their anger, I challenge us to see the impact of oppression on bodies and spirits to honor the outrage, honor the suffering, honor the grief, and honor the power. For outrage and suffering are not synonymous with weakness. I know that I have felt outrage and sadness this week. I am outraged at the grand jury decision because I believe it is the result of an unfair system. I'm outraged that as we waited for the grand jury decision, more lives were lost to police violence. I'm outraged that my black and brown peers are targeted because of their skin color, but as a young white woman, I don't have to worry about being racially profiled. 
I'm saddened by the level of division and mistrust between people of different races, between police officers and communities. I'm saddened by the inability of so many Americans to have civil and respectful dialogue about race and racism, recognizing that I also have room to grow in engaging in such conversations with courage and love. Now, sometimes outrage is channeled in ways that are destructive. A small number of protesters, most of them from outside of the Ferguson community, engaged in protest through arson and looting. The media jumped on this, but failed to cover the actions of Ferguson residents who stood guard at local businesses, protecting them from vandalism. Outrage of another kind, from white supremacists, led the pastor of Michael Brown's family church to receive 71 death threats this week before someone burned down their church building. While outrage has destructive forms, it also has the power to move communities of people in positive and constructive directions. This is already happening, and I hope it will continue. Now, the title of this sermon, as I prepared it over a month ago, is What Are We Waiting For? Today, is the first Sunday of Advent, the four weeks leading up to Christmas. The word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, arriving, approaching, drawing near, or imminent. What do we do when something's approaching? We wait for it with great anticipation and expectation, keeping an eye out for the signs of its arrival. Two millennia ago, a young couple were expectant parents and a community was eagerly anticipating the arrival of their Messiah. They waited with hope and expectation. And today, children eagerly await Christmas, a day of presents and celebration. Some count down the days with Advent calendars, and behind each little door for each day is an image or a poem, a story, or a little treat. A growing up Unitarian Universalist, I lacked a true sense of the meaning of Advent. Some years we had an Advent calendar on the wall, but I wasn't really connected with it as a time of spiritual waiting and preparation. It took on a new and deeper meaning for me during seminary as I learned from my Christian peers. Advent is a time of intentional reflection and preparation meant to bring about inner transformation in the midst of world transformation. The birth of Jesus celebrated each year at Christmas signifies the birth of love, peace, and light in the world. And Advent is a time for us to prepare for this, to be open and awake to the signs of God in the world around us. But Advent is not just a time of peaceful, patient waiting for Christmas or for all that is good and holy to be born into the world. It's also a time of struggle and doubt yearning, and growing awareness. And in this sense, our world is truly in a time of Advent. The world that Jesus was born into resembles ours in some ways. The book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, are the Hebrew scriptures foretelling of the birth of a great son. And in this, they describe the gloom, anguish, and contempt a society fractured by competing sects whose friction was increased by the oppressive rule of Rome. People were outraged and riots were common, yet the prophet had a vision of peace and justice about to be born. So what are you waiting for in this season of Advent? What hope and expectation fills you? Your waiting might be more of the personal nature, like Mary and Joseph's, or perhaps you're waiting for a change in your community or in the world. As I reflect on what I am waiting for in the context of this week's events, I realize that I'm waiting for many things and I see signs of hope around me. I'm waiting not for the birth of a child, but for the life of children killed to be honored and valued and taken seriously. The gathering of thousands of people around the country this week speaking out sends this message and gives me hope 
that the voices calling us to honor and care will prevail over voices that seek to minimize and blame victims. I'm waiting for justice. And to live in a society where institutions don't privilege some at the expense of others, aren't shaped by racism, and truly serve all. I am heartened by those who work in our nation's legal system who are speaking hard truths about the injustices of the system and who I hope will use their positions to work for change. I'm waiting for fear of others to melt away, to live in what's called a beloved community, where we see differences not as a barrier to connection but as part of the beauty of our common humanity. I see signs of this as multiracial groups come together in the streets, in religious communities, and through social media to organize and find common ground. I see signs of this in Ferguson as residents respond to violence by taking care of each other. I see this in a photo that's been circulating around this week from a protest in Portland of a 12-year-old African American and a white police officer hugging with tears streaming down the child's face. I'm waiting for Americans to be able to engage in civil dialogue about race and racism. Dialogue that holds the complexity of our experiences and emotions, is respectful of each other's dignity, and is rooted in empathy. Unfortunately, I've seen too many examples this week of the opposite. But I've also heard calls for people to come together in our communities across racial divides. Our church has done this in many ways, most recently in our discussions of the new Jim Crow, and we are beginning this process again with our Dallas Faces Race group, which you'll hear more about in the coming months. And I am waiting for greater trust between the legal system, the police, and our communities. Trust between these groups is dismally low right now. We see this in the cases of the young men who've been killed and also in the interactions between law enforcement and protesters. Neither police nor community members feel safe in the divided system we now live with, and this puts our whole society at risk. There are numerous organizations around the country that exist with the mission of having these kind of hard conversations and working to build trust. Now, perhaps Ferguson, Missouri isn't quite ready for this yet, but I'm waiting for the day that they are ready, when the majority black community and the majority white city government and police can all put down their guns and riot gear and fear and suspicion and take the first steps toward building a relationship where those charged with serving and protecting the community may do so. Waiting for all of this, compassion and dialogue and justice and trust to be born into the world is not easy, as the poet Langston Hughes wrote, I'm so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind? Waiting like this requires honesty, speaking hard truths and having difficult conversations. And lest we lose hope, it requires us to be awake to what is already unfolding in our midst. Our reading from Henry Nouwen talks about waiting not as a passive state, but active, knowing that what we are waiting for is growing from the ground on which we are standing. Active waiting is being fully present to the moment so that we can see what is unfolding around us, nourishing the seed that has been planted, acknowledging that what we yearn for and what we are waiting for is not going to plunk down in front of us sometime in the future. For each of the things I await, I try to see the signs of hope and the ways in which they are already coming about. We must open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to what is coming and become a means by which peace and love and justice are born into the world. This is one of the hopeful messages of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Goodness already exists here. But that, that, that does not mean that everything is good. Existence is good, the world is good, and our lives and our bodies are good. And we struggle with injustice and evil. Our work to bring greater compassion and love in our world is part of bringing this goodness more fully into existence. 
And this is what the time of Advent is for, to be aware, to struggle, and to help bring about the hope and the promise of all that Jesus' birth symbolizes. Paul Tillich, a Christian theologian, talks about two kinds of waiting, the passive waiting in laziness and the receiving waiting in openness. He who waits in laziness passively, says Tillich, prevents the coming of what he is waiting for. She who works in quiet tension, open for what she may encounter, works for its coming. I love this image of waiting with openness to receive. It reminds me of a line from the song Joy to the World, with which we conclude our Christmas Eve services. Let every heart prepare him room. And in our poem that Scott read, Sacrament of Waiting, it talks of the tree's readiness to receive. So how might we use this season of Advent to engage in the spiritual practice of receiving waiting in openness? What would it look like to prepare ourselves to receive and to live in a more loving, just, and compassionate world? I think it begins with what I talked about earlier, listening, honoring, speaking truths, engaging in dialogue, and then down the road, a more lasting justice and peace may be born. I also go back to Ansong Su Chi's explanation of compassion that we've been returning to again and again as a church this year, where she talks about compassion as having the courage to see, to feel, and to act. First, we must see others. We must see the despair and outrage and the deep systemic unfairness and lack of respect for human life that causes such suffering then we must feel. Now, I cannot know the outrage of a mother who has lost her son, or of an African American who has been targeted again and again because of the color of their skin, nor can I know the feelings of a police officer who shoots and kills. But I can have empathy for them, and I can seek to understand the situation from their perspective. Only if we are able to do this can we then act in solidarity with those most affected, owning who we are and our biases while seeking to transform the world that we share. Back in August, I preached about the legacy of our universalist tradition and its call to love the hell out of the world. I believe this is what we are called to do again now, to love the hell out of the world, to resist the forces of fear and racism that seek to divide our humanity. I hope we can continue this conversation and that it won't end today or tomorrow or when the mainstream media stops covering Ferguson, Missouri. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to seek out sources of information, to read Michelle Alexander's book, to connect with St. Louis Standing on the Side of Love, a group of Unitarian Universalists organizing in the St. Louis area in response to the situation in Ferguson. I encourage you to talk to your family, friends, neighbors, elected representatives, and local law enforcement. Talk with people whose identities and opinions you share and people whose identities and opinions are different than yours. And when you see an announcement about a Dallas Faces Race event here at the church, I invite you to come join the conversation. We all have something to bring to the table. I hope you will join in working for a better world so that when it comes into being, in big and little ways, you will be ready to receive it. This morning, I pray that we may be open to see and to hear our fellow people. I pray that we all may know and experience the truth that their lives matter. I pray for healing and relationship building. I pray that love will guide our words and deeds. I pray that a more lasting justice and peace may prevail. And I commit to joining with you to make these so. Amen.